A Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects, the arts and culture app. Created by Bloomberg Philanthropies, Bloomberg Connects lets you access museums, galleries and cultural spaces around the world on demand. Download the app to access digital guides and explore a variety of content. Hello, I'm Ben Luke and welcome to A Brush With, the podcast from the art newspaper in which I talk to artists about their influences from writers to musicians, filmmakers and of course other artists and the cultural experiences that have shaped their lives and work. And in this episode, it's A Brush With, Urs Fischer, whose work across multiple disciplines and media defies categorisation. Whether he's working in photography, painting, drawing, sculpture or installation, Urs often upends the given characteristics of his medium. His work is in a state of constant transformation, being pushed and pulled in unexpected directions, often with a pronounced absurdity and always with a distinctive impact. Urs was born in 1973 in Zurich in Switzerland. He began studying photography at the Schule für Gestaltung in Zurich, but by the age of 19 he was seeking an artistic life outside of Switzerland, moving first to Amsterdam before spending time in London and Berlin and eventually settling in New York. He now divides his time between New York and Los Angeles. An early example of his unorthodox approach to materials and knowing play with language was Rotten Foundation from 1998, in which he roughly constructed a wall from concrete blocks on top of fruit that steadily rotted across the period of the installation. By 2003, and by then based in New York, he had two landmark shows that reflected the breadth and ambition of his practice and his ability to encompass every aspect of the experience of making and showing art. At Sadie Cole's HQ in London, he showed a group of three rather crudely fashioned nude female figures. The gallery called them a lumpen version of the Three Graces from wax. They were, in fact, candles that were lit so that they melted and self-destructed across the course of the exhibition. At Gavin Brown's Enterprise in New York, meanwhile, he cut a vast hole out of the gallery wall and propped the cut-out shape against another wall. Both of these aspects have continued to be crucial in subsequent years. Urs has now made numerous candle sculptures, from portraits of art world luminaries and friends, to vast reproductions of art historical masterpieces. Perhaps the most dramatic example was first shown at the Venice Biennale in 2011, a wax copy of Gian Bologna's late 16th century Mannerist sculpture, Abduction of the Sabine women. Part of the power of the candle pieces is the spectacle of their entropy. They don't just gently melt. Limbs and other chunks of these once immaculate forms fall dramatically to the floor. And the wall cutout, called Portrait of a Single Raindrop, led to a whole series of destructive interventions in the gallery space. At the Whitney Biennial in 2006, Urs cut two such holes that jaggedly framed his works and those of other artists. The following year, he dug a vast hole more than two metres deep in the floor of Gavin Brown's gallery in New York into which visitors were invited to climb. It was both a nod to the history of earthworks by artists like Walter de Maria and Robert Smithson and an absurdist gesture in a white cube gallery space. And Urs has consistently sought to disrupt his viewers' experiences, to engage them as participants in his dramaturgy. Since 2004, he's created showers of cartoonish plaster raindrops in single colours or spectrums of rainbow hues that intervene with his audience's ability to see other works in his shows. And the work The Kiss from 2017 features a plasticine clay version of Rodin's celebrated sculpture, which visitors can pull lumps from to form into new sculptures, sometimes reattaching them to the original piece, elsewhere fixing the to the wall and windows of the gallery space. Urs has a knack for taking the familiar and making it strange, something that clearly evokes surrealist strategies. He's made countless works involving humble items of furniture, which he twists in playful or disconcerting ways. Beds have provided particularly rich territory. Horsebed from 2013 stages an apparent collision between a full-size horse and a hospital bed cast in gleaming metal. In Untitled Soft Bed of 2011, the frame and mattress appear to have buckled cartoonishly and a paint with a gradient of colour drawn from a kitsch image of a sunset. In Kratz, also of 2011, a bed cast in aluminium appears to collapse under the weight of concrete rubble. In Two Dimensions too, Urz's simple disruptions create dramatic images. In his problem paintings of 2011 and 2012, he takes publicity images of icons of stage and screen, blows them up and colours them, and then slaps images of fruit and vegetables or objects like bolts and spanners on top of them. In his exhibition Ice Cream Truck Democracy at Gagosian Gallery, 
Gallery in Beverly Hills in 2022, he created dizzying collages made of his own photographs and broad gestural paint marks to create a synthesis of his experiences of Los Angeles. Those paintings are often vast, and scale is another artistic problem that Erz treats with extraordinary flair. He's created a series of sculptures that take clay forms intimately modelled with fingers and blow them up on a monumental scale, such that the fingerprints become deep channels within the forms which abstractly evoke human bodies. These are often presented outdoors and reflect Erz's profound consideration of the role of sculpture in public space. And his engagement with the history of sculpture led him to being invited to curate a show of the American sculptor John Chamberlain's work opening in December 2023 at the Aspen Art Museum in Colorado in the US. Our conversation took place just as that show was being completed and I began by asking him what it was like as an artist with such a distinctive presence to curate the show of another artist's work. It's a new experience for me insofar that you need a different set of questions than when you put together your own show. Like you have to be respectful. You could go another route, but it's more like I learn a lot because you look at somebody's entire oeuvre that's not around anymore. So you can kind of see it all. Everything is accessible. It's not like there is still an open future. So you kind of start to dig in there and try to see your own story that the one that you see and you stumble across a lot of stories that people made up they made their own John Chamberlain story like in this case and you try to pay attention to that too so it's kind of like a balance like what's the story that has been told what's the the mythologies that have been woven around this work and what do you see right if you're asked as an artist to curate somebody's show like should that look different than a curated show by a museum curator? Or, you know, there's just a lot of questions, but initially it seemed simpler than it is, you know, because I never dealt with, you know, we have restrictions with historical work, nobody wants to lend it. Right. So you kind of need to find your way around it. It was fun, I have to say. There's a wonderful artist book that's been published. I've seen a PDF of it. And I love the fact that in it, there's a sort of brief intro that you give and you say that... The juxtapositions are frivolous, assumptious, and simply fraudulent occasionally. I like that idea that you're testing the work in a way, and it really feels like that. You're juxtaposing these images from different parts of art history, from other disciplines and so on. And it seems to me there's a really creative investigation of Chamberlain's work within that context. Well, it became clear to me, like, one of the tasks would be to see the work in a new light or a different light, you know, and... That could be achieved by the selection or by juxtaposing it. To juxtapose somebody's work with a work you choose from another artist, basically, is difficult because the task is to showcase John Chamberlain. So that's why I opted for to make an artist book. So one page is John Chamberlain, one page is something else. So you have that book for free when you walk into the show, but what you see in the show is only his work. You could think of it as an off voice in a movie. Ah, nice. Yeah, that's very nice. You know, so you don't need to always do it visually. You can also do it in another way. This is a visual off voice. So you think like biography of a man like this who was born in 1927, moved to Chicago just after the Great Depression with his mom. The things you have been exposed to, then you see Pearl Harbor, like a first time, like a large scale destruction of machines. And all that is part of the landscape that you experience, you know. And the invention of garbage, so to speak, you know, industrial products that became uh, obsolete and then they just stand around. Uh, The violence of machines when they start having accidents or, you know, all these other elements come to play in that, you know. So, like, how do you weave that story into what you see? So. Absolutely. And, and speaking of the biography, I noticed that there was a Dorothea Lang photograph. And speaking of that sort of idea of the Great Depression in that period, it speaks so much. About, and it was a vehicle with a family. And, and, and again, it sort of made me think about Chamberlain's work in a new way. So you talked about curating it as being a lot of fun. You must have had a lot of fun when you were pulling these images together. Yeah, I mean, that's actually a little fraudulent because I think he moved with his mother in 1931. And where he grew up, there was no Dust Bowl and the Dust Bowl was in 36. So That's what I'm saying. (laughs) But you do see this car and all the possessions of these people 
are piled onto this car and you just see like there is a fence, there is a mattress, there I don't know, there are pots and yeah, it's just this very different life than we have now for It seems to me that one of the key things that your work has in common with Chamberlain's is transformation. Tell me about that. I think I just get bored so quickly. But in <laughs> in his work he's a funny person because he's not a person from the fifties somehow. But there is an abstract expressionist side, like in a way of more in the painting end of it. It's not about appropriation like in pop art, but it is a little bit, you know, because a lot of the earlier pieces have just straight up car parts. But the interest doesn't go into other parts of the car. That could also be, it's just the metal and the paint. So it's very reduced in a way. So that's a kind of a, a little minimalist side. So it's a kind of person where a lot of other movements pave it around or, but it is very formal. Yeah, exactly. It is very formal. It has distinct formal properties. But in some ways, the formal properties of that work, it's about the way that the works are compressed or pulled apart or, or, or whatever. So there's a sort of violence, but yet a containment. And there's a sort of tension in that, isn't there? There is. And um, talking of a church or the fun part of, of a curation for me as an artist, where you learn for yourself, not as an external exercise, I started to see an arc. My first question was basically, what is he crushing here? You know, is it himself or is it something exterior like uh, you know <laughs> and i think initially these things seem to be kind of outside of the body and if you look at the very late works they almost seem to like in the last two three years they seem to kind of embrace themselves so it's rather than it's they're crushed and compacted they kind of wrap around themselves so that if it's about that you crush yourself there seems to be like a softness that kind of manifests itself in the end. And tell me about how it's made you reflect on your own practice, if it has at all. I'm not a manic crafts person. By that, I mean, there is the artists that go to the studio and just need to make things. So you can learn something, but you cannot change the way you are. I mean, this is somebody that really is all in the process and I don't take this way. So there are process moments, but I try to keep it all open for myself, you know. I wanted to talk a bit about the fact that you began with photography. And of course, photography has formed an important part of your work ever since. And it comes into focus at various points, if you'll forgive the pun. Do you see photography still as your primary sort of background medium, if you like, even though, of course, you're probably best known as a sculptor? Is photography and the image that is produced from photography still a kind of guiding sort of underground element to all the work? You know, you can look at these distinctions in disciplines or you can also kind of ignore them. I mean, photography is just an extension of seeing, you know, somehow they had this desire to develop these contraptions to capture what they see or something along these lines. And that's how I see photography is just like a way of looking at stuff. And you can use that in so many different ways. And the image you have, it's just a two-dimensional thing that you can then repurpose so I think of it more as it's one version of an image. If you do paint the same image, it's much more about you painting that image. I think it's more a way to appropriate reality or something, you know. Absolutely. And, and, and in a way, that sort of idea of appropriating reality, I love the way in your shows that one feels a sort of groundedness in the everyday, but also an element of fantasy and the different registers as they sort of wrap round each other and sort of undermine each other or support each other. It seems to me there's a wonderful tension, in a way, between the kind of reality and fantasy. I'm thinking, for instance, at the Sadie Coles HQ show where you had one of the raindrop works. I think it was called Melodrama. And then you also had the clay nudes on the couches at the same time. And there was this sort of intriguing balance between those different registers at which those works were performing, if you like, in the space. Yeah, they just inhabited that place. And, you know, that started as an accident. I made all the sculptures on site. Sometimes it's good to start with something known, like a reclining nude, you know, like some throughout art history. So I started to make one and then I thought, why make other images just repeated and so and variations of. And it was more like just to give a, a feeling of a space where it expands, then you're immersed between the field that opens, you know. Yeah, but is it right that you shipped the clay over and made the works in that space? Yeah. So there was an element of unknown, an element at risk in terms of coming into that installation and, and making the work. Well, you take a risk when you control it too, you know. 
Of course. <laughs> <laughs> but in a way, that's sometimes where the joy of an exhibition is, isn't it? In that sort of tension between the different works, the way that you can juxtapose your own works to play on tensions between the different forms. I think, to my surprise, you often find it when you make any work, there is the common turning point. So very often you start out doing something, if you even know what you do, you get to a place, then you, it's almost like you go in the reverse. You kind of back out of it and then something shifts and that's when the work becomes a work. I don't trust the work that comes too easy. Right. But I don't trust the work that is too labored either. So it's kind of like a, it needs to make itself. Right. And is it right that quite often your work will start in a certain way, you know, at the beginning of the concept, if you like, and then by the time you've actually completed it, it will have taken a completely different form and might even be made from a completely different material. Yeah, or, or sometimes you, you shelf some uh, work for 10 years because you don't know how to resolve it and all of a sudden the same interest resurfaces but you have a different vocabulary at the time, you know. Absolutely. I wanted to explore the kind of mood in the work because one of the things that I'm really struck by is that lots of your work appeals to notions of entropy or collapse or disintegration but I don't think one would ever say that your work is in some way pessimistic or suggests a kind of existential crisis of any kind. To me it's really intriguing whether you want to create a mood with the work, whether you're aiming to create a feeling from within it or whether you leave that completely open to interpretation. Back to the idea of control, you can think you can control it, you cannot control it anyway. You know, reality takes sharp turns. You know, you can be in sync with something and the collective reality can just, or, or your personal one, can take really sharp turns. So you never understand the context outside of your intuition, I believe. My intuition is, is the, the thing I trust most in all aspects of life, you know. But one thing I'm conscious of is that I will quite often walk through your shows and I will laugh. But again, in terms of that kind of being in between states, it doesn't mean that the work is less serious, even though it will provoke a kind of humorous reaction or whatever. And it seems, again, that's a, that seems to me that's a productive space to make art within, if you like. Yeah, I mean, you know, there are, there are many ways to understand what art is and um, whoever has an answer wears blinders, you know. The way I understand it, it's a huge open landscape, and in these open landscapes there are certain towns and villages, and in this village they have a very particular idea of what they do. But you can go many places, and you find other ideas and other definitions, and sure, you want to live somewhere and have a dialogue with the people in your town, village, whatever. Like, I grew up in a country where, the way I understand it is, they think they're normal, Okay. <laughs> and they're so fetishistically normal that they're kind of crazy in some way, <laughs> you know? But that's, it's kind of beautiful. And so back to this landscape, it's just there's so many ways to do it. And I think there's more people now working in art that don't make art, that work around art, than there are people actually making something. That gives more weight to trying to understand what art is than through making it. You know, so it's kind of like, I think it's a scale. It's a little overwhelming I can imagine it is at times, yeah. But one of the things that's interesting, of course, is that scale is such an important element of the work to you and, and that you have this sort of ability to shift scales very abruptly but also to make, for instance, incredibly vast sculptures as well as tiny and apparently almost casual work. So is scale a consideration almost right at the start of a project? Can the scale considerations be made at any point, if you like? There are two places where scale originates. One is the place the work is shown in, and one is what you set out to do, you know. I think in the past there were some galleries, somebody told me at Door Fair or whatever, that said the door was kind of smaller than the gallery because if it didn't fit through there, it wouldn't fit in the collector's house. So you kind of help uh, artists not making works that are too big. So now, if you think of any house, like there are not many big spaces in most people's houses, but if you look at the galleries, they're so big. So the same can happen to your studio. I used to have a huge studio, so everything looks kind of small. It just feels right when it's very big, but it's just like, these are more circumstantial. And then other things are somehow, for me, the radius of your body or your perception. If you sit somewhere, you have a small radius of your hand, your wrist, your fingers, maybe your arm, shoulder. If you stand up, you move your body, your upper body. 
if you move through something, you kind of, it just expands and contracts. And then it's how do you want to relate to the artwork? Is it something that it's just like an image? An image doesn't have a size. You can say like people that matter to you in your life are way bigger than things you don't know. They kind of shrink. Or if you read the news, you read about certain places, but not about others. You don't even hear about it. So these things take on a scale. And and like yesterday I was with my daughter and she was asked, um, she's kind of tall for her age. And she was like, so how tall are the boys in your class? And she showed like half her size, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so that's scale for you right there, you know? It's just <laughs> so some of it comes from perceived scale, you know? If it involves an entire the architecture or works that basically deal with a space, logically they're as big as a space, you know. Let's move on to the questions that we ask all our guests. Who was the first artist whose work you loved? Um, when I was a little kid, there were a bunch of art books at my grandparents and there was a, a Bruegel and a Bosch book that were kind of way more interesting than Modigliani or something, you know. It was one of these <laughs> series of like 30 books, art history, you probably buy a subscription. Like you get every month one or something. But, you know, I never ask questions. I mean, I made three or four and you just look at this imagery. It's self-explanatory in a way, but it's also very mysterious because you don't know what they're up to. But that's awesome. Like to this day, I love yeah, me too. And one of the things I love about it is there is a kind of coded language that I'm probably never going to understand. And yet still, it appeals to me in the same way. I agree with you as, as almost in a childlike way, the fantasy is so appealing that you just get sucked into it, regardless of whether you know those codes or whatever. Yeah, and all the little figures and what they do, or, you know, I still have a big, open, soft spot for that. And which historical artist do you turn to the most today? If it comes to sculptures, I very often think about Bernini or Michelangelo. Not that I make any sculptures that have anything to do with it. It's just like Bernini, like his best works he made in his 20s. So it's also really athletic to do these marble works that are so alive in a way, you know. Michelangelo is just the imagery. It's usually one angle that it looks great and the other ones are okay, but it's more like a photographic angle, like boom, the perfect or coming out of drawing or I don't know how he worked, you know. Mm. But these are about artists. There's other artworks that I... Yeah, pyramids and stuff that I kind of like more, but like, right. But I think one of the things about Benini is that his ability to speak across time, which it seems to me is extraordinary. And one of the ways, for instance, is that it seems to me that the mattress that he made for the sleeping hermaphrodite is like a kind of contemporary artwork, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Yeah, I mean, it, you're right. Across time, both ways, it goes to the past and the future. It's just so timeless. I don't know what it is, but in person, like, divine. Yeah. One of the things also, I think, is that in Bernini's time, there's a lot of really skillful sculptures at that time whose work strays into kitsch, but Bernini never does. And I, if you asked me to say why, I couldn't. But at the same time, there's a sort of power in what Bernini's doing, which just transcends everybody else of his time. It's not just about skill. It's about something else, you know, kind of uh, maybe an unnameable element or something. Yeah, art. There you go. It's art. <laughs> I wanted to talk about Jan Bologna's Abduction of the Sabine Women, which, of course, is among your most famous works, but probably the work you're best known for in terms of the candle pieces. Why did you choose that work? What was significant about that? You know, it didn't start with that work. I, at the time, shared a studio with Rudi Stengel, and I wanted to have Rudi looking at a historical sculpture. So I looked for a good historical sculpture that kind of is interesting and I think the movement of that sculpture is great but the details are really not filling you with a lot of emotions and there was just something about it I looked at a lot of online stuff and in my memory and then I had a Taschen book of renaissance or something and just like somehow I kept going back to that sculpture and then we, we, we made contact with the people in Florence and we offered to donate money in return for having the ability to scan it I mean ah. it's not they don't have a copyright on it but that the money would go into the restoration of the sculpture I don't know if it ever did but that was the, the idea you take somebody also give some to preserve the original you know Right, yeah. I mean, I also wondered about its verticality. It has extraordinary verticality, that piece, and it works so effectively in the space when the wax is dripping from such a height. 
Yeah, I mean, he was a very, from what I know, it seems to be a technically a very, very skilled sculptor. That thing was made out of marble, so it had the same problems I would have with wax, you know, in this case. Yeah, it was a quite an engineering feat to create a candle yeah. out of that. <laughs> and I also like that, you know, the one finger on the top, it reaches to the sky or trying to escape the planet or whatever she does, you know. Yeah. And you start kind of lighting it up there. And Yeah. There's obviously a very famous work that you did involving Rodan's The Kiss, which was clay, and you allowed people to come up and grab pieces of clay and mould them and take them off and write on the walls. An extraordinary thing that happened in London, which was writing on the windows of the gallery and all of the walls and so on with, with this clay. What's the difference between the clay and the wax works? What two processes are we watching or what, what were your intentions for the differences? If you think of like a candle, what you have is you have a human order versus natural order in some way. You make a shape or you appropriate a shape or a combination of the two. And then the rest is physics, you know. It burns and it melts and there is a certain size of a drip. But that's still something you experience from the outset. Who doesn't want to touch an artwork? I always do, you know. <laughs> I had a various run-ins with this uh, Rodin, the Kiss. I think my parents once gave me a white chocolate, the Kiss sculpture or something. Oh. You can eat it, you know. <laughs> it's kind of a... That was also talking of curating you. Then I started to look at this Kiss sculpture, and he actually turns away from her. If you look at his legs and his upper body, he's kind of... He doesn't want to be kissed, and she's kind of latching on to him. So it is not as straightforward a kiss image as you would think it is. That was plasticine, you know, which is kind of like a whatever type, an artificial oil-based clay or whatever it is mm. uh, made of. And it's a little harder. You cannot just squeeze it and it's fast. Yeah. I thought it's like, okay, if you unleash the, the people onto a finished image, the image will be destructed. But you could theoretically make the image whole again if you if that was your intention you know let's talk about contemporary art which contemporary artists do you most admire i think about it as a all you can eat breakfast buffet <laughs> in a in a big hotel you know it's just there are some main staples but so many things pop up and for a month it really fascinates you and then you forget about it and then it comes back it's not a question I could answer. I could answer it like in each moment to some degree. Yeah. You know, it's a lot of self-serving back to the buffet. <laughs> it's like, you know, you try to figure out something and somebody else has figured it out. So that's... Uh, you mentioned Rudy Stingle earlier on and sharing a studio with him. That must have been an extraordinary productive moment. I mean, you know, being in the same studio world while both of you are working, there must have been really interesting connections in that period yeah i mean our work is so different and we did it we did like yeah. three or four bigger projects together at that time too our work being so different but we had a, we spend a lot of time together that's the interesting stuff you don't understand this synergy and symbiosis you know these energies you cannot quantify i wanted to ask you about the uh, remarkable piece which was called josh smith where you took photographs obviously of his studio and then effectively wallpapered a space with those photographs again you know that was an extraordinary idea of in a way kind of appropriating another artist's space for your own work tell me what inspired that you know josh is a good friend of mine and he had these two studios somewhere in the garment district in new york and he had these two floors and they were not very big and he was really making so much work at the time and he was so prolific and after he moved out like a day or so after he moved out of the space after five years so rather than photographing it when he was actively in there it's kind of just after he moved out i photographed that space you know so it's kind of like it's a space where so much happened in but you cannot see it in that way you know I wondered if it was like conjuring his spirit or something. <laughs> maybe. It's just you're in that space where these things transpire. It would be interesting maybe down the line to, I don't know, use that in some form. Yeah, absolutely. What do you have pinned to the studio wall? Mainly my kids' work because they insist on it. Um, <laughs> then I have some, some other people's artworks up because I just like that. It's a little more homey than your own stuff. I mean, there are two types of artists, the ones that live with their work and the ones that don't, you know? Right, yeah. I don't. There's a bunch of things. There's a Spencer Sweeney painting. There's some photograph by Rowe. There's a Karl-Heinz Weinberger photograph that I have here. I don't know. Mm -hmm. 
there's two Larry Clark photos and the rest is my kids work and then sometimes I keep up like some failed experiment that I don't even know what it is and I keep that out somehow the rest of my work I always take everything out of studio I, I don't have anything here right so often when I have a studio visit it's kind of like empty because I make it and it goes out A Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects, the arts and culture app. The free app offers access to more than 300 cultural organisations through a single download, with new guides being added regularly. Among the most recent additions to the app are Denver Botanic Gardens and the Museum of Neon Art in Glendale, California. As you've heard, Urs Fischer is curating an exhibition of the work of John Chamberlain at the Aspen Art Museum, which has a guide on Bloomberg Connects. If you download the guide to the museum, you can find a feature on the Chamberlain exhibition, as well as a section on the exhibition series called A Lover's Discourse, in which an emerging artist chooses to juxtapose their works with those of an influential figure. The next artist to feature, from the 14th of December 2023, is Izzy Wood, whose paintings will be displayed alongside a canvas by Fernando Botero. To explore digital guides to all the partnering institutions, Download the app today. It's available from the App Store and Google Play, and you can keep up to date by following Bloomberg Connects on Facebook, X, formerly known as Twitter, and Instagram. Which museum or gallery do you visit most frequently? I think my favourite museum is the Met and the National Gallery in London. Yeah. Tell me about the National Gallery, because you used the National Gallery, a very particular space, the post-impressionist space, yeah. for your work, People. Tell us about that. Well, I went in there as a teenager, so I'm at 16, or I forgot when, and I was just in that space. And first of all, I liked a lot of the, the works in there, logically, it's beautiful. Mm. Like that particular room is the moment where the hand got freed from obligations to illustrate something else where it doesn't need to illustrate it in that way it can express itself hesitantly but in a personal way and you can embrace topics that are matter to you not to some institution of power or whatever we're maybe now in a post that but it's really the idea of 20th century art too is a personal expression or you share things and that you have you can take any medium any way any part of your body to express that and so it's really like the birthplace of, or one of the birthplaces of that. And everybody that walked into this room has an experience, you see? So you can just stand in this room and you can look at the people. It's like it's like your own little Tino Seagal there. There are many galleries full of these brown paintings that people just walk by. Maybe you stop with the Caravaggio because it's great. And then there's all these historical representations and they don't have that same appeal. They were of service to something. But in that room, everybody feels something and you just... Watch that. And my thoughts at the time was it's like a perpetual mobile. You know, it's like you put energy in and it keeps giving energy out forever. I mean, you could say the same about, uh, you know, a Rolling Stones song that's recorded once that keeps giving to even, you know, like it doesn't matter. Right. Yeah. And so the talking heads, these projected heads, tell us about what they signify. Well, what we did is we replicated that room, like so yeah. with all the moldings and whatever, but I made the room white so I could project on. So we had really nice reproductions made, including the frames and the paintings that are in that space. That keeps changing, but we kind of found like a middle way of what has been there over the decades. And projected over that we collected or i collected around ten thousand heads like people that talk into a camera you know like there's a lot of people talking into a camera now for whatever <laughs> reason with whatever opinion so it's just these heads and we cut them out digitally and then these heads they come more like cells they pop up each one is one minute long and they keep growing and expanding and contracting and the space they open is then used by other ones. And these heads of these people talking at you in the moment project over these images that are just there and keep giving. But it's just, I just it's an interesting point, you know. You're all neat in a way to be seen, to be heard, to be whatever, you know. And the, also the total amnesia you have in this culture of now uh, versus these very, very slow burning elements you know 
And funny enough, like a week after it opened, it was the first time they put a soup can or whatever <laughs> over one of these paintings. It was literally just a little before that, like a lot of artworks got used for to get attention. <laughs> right, yes, of course, because it was the sunflowers, which is obviously one of the works in that very room, yeah, as you say. Yeah. yeah of course. Which cultural experience changed the way you see the world? Probably the earliest cultural experience I have is whenever you leave your country, like in my case, Switzerland. So you go either to France, you go to Germany, which at the time hardly anybody did, or you go to Italy. And as soon as you cross the border, everything changed. The houses looked a little different, the cars, the people, cafes were different, what you order, the food was a little different. You know, it was just always like so fascinating that a border, the language changes, you just go, here is the the border and you could cross the border and you're like somewhere else so in a way i always felt like how made up everything is on either side of the border you know? <laughs> or how not made up but like how it just grew into what it is and then you hold on to that very fascinating and of course you traveled a lot before you settled in the states didn't you as an artist in your early years yeah and of course you weren't sort of crossing borders to say which one felt right but i'm interested that america became the place that you settled what did New York, as it was at the time, offer you that perhaps other spaces where you'd stopped hadn't? It just happened. It happened by itself. I started to spend more and more time there every year, you know. In the beginning, you go for one week, then you go there. All of a sudden, you realise I'm here like two months out of the year for various reasons. And then I thought, oh, maybe I could live here. Or, you know. So I never had a desire to live there when I was younger because I knew all the kids that went to New York they were all like, okay, you go to New York, so bye, you know. It was like just paired with like overly ambitious people in my mind. So I thought that place must be full of these people, which kind of is, but there's a lot more to it, like a lot, a lot more. I never had the urge to do that. I did like California as a teenager growing up in a medieval culture, basically. I liked the idea of the opposite of that, like where the Western culture falls into the ocean basically you know there was a group of vast recent paintings that you made which were kind of a homage to california right these kind of collagey paintings effectively yeah about the visual experiences i have here in la and I also made some folder books of that and mm. it's interesting it comes into composition i mean la is interesting in this way if you think of an image you know a lot of imagery is asia europe it has like a central motive or something, you know, it's kind of works at, and probably coming out of being spiritual imagery in some way where there is a, a center or a, you know, or there is a kind of manifestation of something. And what was always appealing to me uh, as a teenager and a bit later is, let's say, it's an image that came out of America that seemed to not have that. I mean, the Warhol is very much like a, same as this traditional European image, but there were other things that kind of looked weird or I never understood. I never understood what this uh, Rauschenberg, some white cloths, what is this? But, you know, but intriguing, you know? And as you live in a place that is maybe just kind of happened more, that grew in a different way. There is all these different cultural elements. It's not like coming at the same time together, paired with a lot of necessity, together with a, a world ruled by bookkeepers and profits that just kind of create their own visual imagery. And if you think you grow up here, that's the same as it is growing up in in Siena and you think that's the way it should be. You know, you have the same set of emotions to this place and but then I started reading and I started making these images that some of them have a central image, but it's more this experience of just putting it together without going into composition. And then I found a John Cage book, mm. which was very interesting because he didn't really know what to do. I think they sent him to Paris to study architecture. He couldn't care less. Then he came back. He gave lectures about art to some ladies in Santa Monica, whatever, where they were affluent. So that they gave him some money. So that's how he made money. Then he got into composition. And I think Schoenberg was teaching here at the time. And he said, basically, he has no sense for harmonies. And then he thought, okay, great. So I have something. Yeah. <laughs> so let's work off that, you know. That's a quality in itself rather than a failure. And if you think of the influence of, of this person together logically with a lot of others that are not included in this little story, but this kind of thought of an image that doesn't need to be this image that isn't recognizable 
experience, you know, where it's just um, a thing. It's kind of freeing for me. Right. I can imagine. Which writers or poets do you return to? I, you know, a, a person that I cannot shake is Philip K. Dick. It's not that I particularly often read any of his stories anymore, but it's very interesting in a way that it is somewhat lowbrow in some way, but it isn't. It's very, it's just to the point. It doesn't lose much time with descriptions of light coming into a room and, you know, and all this kind of nostalgia stuff. It's, but there is something existential about most of it that I really like. And I was just recently thinking about, is there something like a Jungian comedy which I don't, probably, but in that way, and then you think of Philip K. Dick's later work on Jung's excursion into an inner and outer world that is either collective or not. And I think, like, I like Philip K. Dick's version because it's always like, am I just crazy? <laughs> or, or is it something? Or is it a bit of both? Or like, it just seems always somewhat open, if that makes sense. Which music or other audio do you listen to while you're working? In studio, this is like the, back again to the All You Can Eat buffet. I mean, there's so many things. And luckily here in LA, I have uh, one kid helping me who has the same palette. Like just yesterday, we revisited Moby. Then we had a George Michael in-depth face. <laughs> and then we can go into very abstract compositions. It's a, like very open and so this person here, he has a great playlist. Right. I wanted to ask you about Heads, your jazz project with Spencer Sweeney, which was basically a kind of jazz improv club, effectively, which also had a kind of drawing workshop as part of it. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's, it was pretty simple. I saw some cool drawings that Spencer made, Spencer Sweeney, and I thought it would be cool to make a show with it was some heads he drew of people. And I thought it would be a cool show to just have more people come in, like, let's say, in a gallery, and every day another artist comes in and draws more heads and puts that on a wall. You know, and it's just the show keeps growing. And it's just, it's like a very urban experience, all these different people you're exposed to all the time. So then, at the time, Spencer had a studio that he kind of couldn't get any work done in. Some studios have that, but, I said, but he still had a lease. So then he said, okay, we have that for nine months, so let's do it there. The music came first, like, just listening to records. And it was the idea, so we just have a place where rather than going to our own studio doing art, we just have a place where we can talk and doodle and hang out and kind of break that whole thing a little open. And that morphed into bringing in through these two great musicians that kind of were leading. The one is Pete Drummond and the other one is Craig Harris. So they brought in other musicians. So we had a kind of a life not like a concert, but a little between a jam session and a concert. We just filled the room with art materials and we never advertised it. So it was just the people that came. So we had people from the neighborhood. We had all kinds of people from 80 to 5, you know. What we didn't have were many artists because the artists come in there and they somebody that works as a dental hygiene person just draw some stuff, there is nothing to lose. And I always felt like a lot of artists didn't really like it because they felt under pressure to perform. And so we just had that going every Sunday and there was food and then there was music and some people stayed very long. So everything that people created was kept in the space if they wanted. So we hung everything up. And so it was just like a little utopian idea of where you take these boundaries a little down and it's really just about creating and having a joy with that, you know. What other media influence your work? I do like popular culture a lot, mm. like in, in various forms, you know. I'm, I was blessed with um, a great decade for music videos when I was young. The creativity expressed in that was just really like a beautiful explosion to me, you know. Do you mean the 1980s, that sort of early music video, basically, that sort of period? Yeah, well, it's going from the 80s into the 90s. Mm. And, you know, you had the interesting people, like their chairman and so on, like mm. doing music videos. I just thought it was an interesting collapse of, of music and, and the visuals in motion. You know, you have that earlier in popular culture, but it's like at that speed where these things get released. And that was really awesome. That definitely, like, was an inspiration. 
I read that you, at one point, while you were an artist, you were watching like five films a day. Yeah. What kind of atmosphere did that create for the work? Did it make you make work differently? Did it affect the work in any way? Or did you just kind of absorb yourself in movies and then go back to making art? It's just to be parallel. I mean, sometimes it got so excessive there was no more work to be done, you know. But, I mean, it's the same thing. Let's say you're a 17, 18-year-old kid and you just start to take one art book out of a shelf anywhere you can tap into a huge universe and it's at their disposal. So all it takes is a little curiosity. And then you see there is a whole thing you can educate yourself in and it's inspiring. And the same, I think, goes for, for films rather than you just go to the cinema. I mean, you know, if, when video stores and rentals became available for some more art housey and other kind of films, it was easier to access all that. And you really do the same thing. You say, I like this producer, I like this actor, I like this screenwriter. And you just go dig in. You just want to see 10 films, you know? Yeah. Uh, once they did, we went, went to John Ford retrospective, took one month, and I think we watched 30 movies or 30 something. And, or Billy Wilder, I did that too, like in two weeks. Like everything, you get really into it and you start to understand the work you know absolutely there was a great show of yours in london which was called douglas cirque and i wondered if there was a particular reason why you named a show after him it was actually the mirror sculptures yeah and i wondered why you chose to name a show after him he's a sort of he's now much revered but not a big name director but melodramas in technicolor that became revered by all sorts of other directors like fassbender and others you know oh it's so great i mean it's a what a strange character you know yeah i know why I was just interested in Douglas Sir. Well, that show with, that was initially made, there were always two pairs like of cubes together. And initially before that, Sadie had that space at the time, we looked for an, an empty building. And in each room of this empty building, there would be like a double pair. So just by itself. Mm -hmm. And so you, it's like this, you inhabit the building or some spaces, maybe some spaces you don't. And that's where that came from. But then the that space came up for her that she then had for a longer time and it made more sense, you know. Is there a particular discipline in your daily working life that you see as an essential ritual? Um, waiting. Tuning in, waiting and, and not rushing. I mean, everybody's different. For me, the way it works is I most of the time do nothing. I mean, I engage, I do a little something, but... I work very quickly when I work. Things need to align. It sounds a little esoteric, but I can't labor it. If you could live with just one work of art, what would it be? I couldn't make up my mind. I like Stonehenge. I think that's cool. Could totally live with Stonehenge, you know? <laughs> you could live among the stones, yeah. Yeah, no, <laughs> easy, you know? Well, Easter Island is cool, you know? If you don't need to fit inside the house, what would it be? I mean, you know, it's funny enough, you mentioned the sleeping hermaphroditus in, at the Louvre. I think I could do that or I could do with Apollo and Daphne by Bernini. Yeah, you'd never get bored, would you? No. In Stonehenge. <laughs> <laughs> now that's a juxtaposition. And lastly, what's art for? Hopefully nothing. Like nothing of purpose. It doesn't need to be, I mean, it, it just is, I believe, you know. Erz, thank you very much. Thank you. John Chamberlain, the tighter they're wound, the harder they unravel, curated by Urs Fischer, is at the Aspen Art Museum in Colorado in the US from the 15th of December to the 7th of April next year. And that's it for this episode. Please subscribe to A Brush With wherever you're listening and do give us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. Do also subscribe to our sister podcast, The Week in Art, a deep dive into the latest big art world stories, the top shows and the key issues every week. And please subscribe to The Art Newspaper at theartnewspaper.com. We're on X, formerly known as Twitter, at Tan Audio, and on Facebook, Instagram and Threads. Production, editing and sound design on A Brush With are by David Clack and the producer is Lewis Jeb. Thanks also to Daniela Hathaway and a big thank you to as Fisher. We'll see you next week. Bye for now. 
Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects. Download Bloomberg Connects today and discover cultural institutions on demand.